Hey there, so the video I did today actually turned out pretty well. Um, if anybody feels like putting that into a transcript, I would love to make it into a study so I can put all the verses into it. I just don't have time. Um, it's these days now you can go to the right, uh, you can click on the three dots next to a video and t click on download transcript and you toggle off the time strips stamps and then you can copy and paste it into a word document but then you have to put in periods and stuff to make the sentences make sense if anybody feels like doing that and emailing it to me i think i could make it into a good document with some verses to um, help people study it systematically i can organize it a little uh, but the amazing thing is is people understood it and that to me is the result of sowing the word over time and people growing because a year ago, I did touch these things and people were like, what, huh? what, huh? you know? Um, but also the Lord has added vocabulary to help make it clearer and clearer and clearer. He's, you know, the Bible says that people will go to and fro and knowledge will increase. And that is definitely happening. We're seeing an explosion. If you are in the vein of pursuing the truth purely to know Christ, there's a, an outpouring right now but uh anyway i wanted to talk a little more about and and you probably already see it what are the implications of thinking we're under the new covenant and what are the problems you know what's the difference between that and our spirituality you know if we can get to the point where we're t taking it for granted that we're not under the new covenant and that we have something better which is a testament which is an inheritance that's a finished work that's being distributed through a ministry that actually imparts glory. Wow. How exciting is it for us to become New Testament ministers and participate in the ministry of the word? Once you see the intrinsic, what is gospel preaching? You know, gospel preaching is not just getting someone to agree with the gospel. That is part of it because there's a proposition and there's a defense and a confirmation and helping people understand but when they believe the gospel, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the way they believe the gospel intrinsically is that the light of the knowledge of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ shines in their heart. That's how incredible it is. The glory of God is illuminated in the face of Jesus Christ through the gospel in their heart. And remember, John says, in him was life, and the life is the light of man. The light comes and shines, but what is it? It's actually an impartation of life. And they're born of God. You know? They become sons of God and heirs of glory in that moment. That's how glorious it is. Uh, and God does this by impressing Christ into them, his engraving tool. And the spirit is like the wax. The spirit is the ink, right? Because we're epistles of Christ written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on fleshly tail, it's a stone, but in our heart, you know, with the spirit of the living God actually writing Christ into us through gospel preaching, through the New Testament ministry. But see, we've got a superficial idea of what the gospel is. Because we think the gospel still is the ABCs of salvation. Admit you're, I mean, some people think the gospel is. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died for you confess unto salvation that's not the gospel that's the way to receive the gospel the gospel is the person and work of Christ put on display through the New Testament ministry okay the gospel is the unsearchable riches of Christ as an inheritance in the hands of stewards who have uh, studied to show themselves and approved and can handle the word 
to present Christ in cooperation with the Holy Spirit so that when they speak, he shines. And when he shines, he imparts and he seals and he regenerates and he infuses himself and writes himself into man. <laughs> Okay, that's how significant it is. It's just amazing. And that is a building work as well. Because we are participating, as we've been seeing in John 14, in the building of Bethel, God's habitation, in which God dwells in man and man dwells in us. So that in that day, you know that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, and I in you and you in me. We are brought into this mutual indwelling that the Father and the Son already had that has been expanded to include us now. And Christ is being wrought into us. Not just once, okay? Because we think it's the introduction of the Christian life, we think the gospel becomes irrelevant after that, but that's not true. The ministry of the New Testament is for the entirety of the Christian life to continue handling the riches of Christ, to distribute as food and drink, to nourish the saints for their growth, and just as they receive the gospel by faith, they grow by faith. And growth is a continual impartation of Christ into us. As we behold him shining in our hearts through the word, which is handled by a ministry, the New Testament ministry, the stewardship in God's house. And that stewardship, that food, that drink, that nourishing supply is glory it is christ himself as glory as the spirit which is our life and our inheritance it's actually by partaking of our inheritance that we grow it's uh, growing means you are growing in the enjoyment of your position as an heir of a testament that's already been distributed you know, it was distributed when Christ sent forth the Spirit and produced the church. And now that inheritance is in the hands of stewards and being dispensed into the body through the New Testament ministry, which is for God's economy, his household order, his uh, dispensation. And that ministry is how he heads up everything in Christ in the church. It is not through an outward law or God making you do something. It is by your growth as you gain Christ through an appreciation of who he is as your inheritance. See, there's a whole different language. You know, somebody asked me, well, isn't this kind of like progressive sanctification? No, this is transformation and renewing. That's our growth. We're being renewed in the knowledge of him. And that is not just knowledge, that's life. It's light shining. It's the illuminated glory of God shining in the face of God, uh, Jesus Christ in our hearts, which is God's engraving tool to impress his image on our soul, on the wax or the seal of the Holy Spirit who he's given to us. And he seals us and presses and presses and presses and presses. And what makes it all real is the consuming of the outer man and the renewing of the inner man. You know, it is true that if I just speak knowledge, it doesn't help. I need to be able to speak words that are spirit and life. I need to be able to speak in a way that actually imparts Christ. And I can't control that. I don't have the authority to give his life. Only he has the authority to give his life. He's the Lord of life. But what he does is he sovereignly arranges my situations and your situations to bring us into need, to produce thirst and hunger that only he can satisfy. And that's the purpose behind suffering and failure in the Christian life. It is to open you up so that he can impart or work more Christ into you. And the word is wrought. Right? These momentary light afflictions are not worthy to be compared 
to the eternal glory, eternal weight of glory, which is wrought into us while we look not at those things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. What does that mean? Sorry, I got to sniffle. And then I had to spit. Isn't that awesome? Uh, God brings us into suffering. God brings us into affliction. Maybe even embarrassing situations. Discipline. Humiliation even. Right? To make our environment around us a wilderness. So that it is stripped of all of our comforts. Why? So that we will look away from the things that are unseen, are, are seen, the temporary things of this world, and look to Christ. And in those moments, he gives us a glimpse of his illuminated glory in the face of Jesus Christ in our heart. And whenever he does that, he imparts a little more life. And we grow a little more and are transformed a little more and are renewed a little more. And our soul is saved a little more. The salvation of our soul is received as we become full of uh, rejoicing that is full of glory, right? Peter says, whom having not seen you uh, love and you believe and you rejoice and your rejoicing is full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. This is called the salvation of your soul. Your spirit has been saved. It was regenerated. Your body will be saved. It'll be redeemed and transfigured. But in the meantime, your soul needs to be saved. And that is talking about maturity in the Christian life. The salvation of the soul is as you are brought through these different environments that force you to get a glimpse of Christ, which is the same thing as a drink of Christ, okay? You come to Him, and you look away from your situation, and you look to Him, and you open up to Him in faith. And then through the New Testament ministry, or through the Word, which is the New Testament ministry, you behold something of Him in that situation. And that's His shining on you, and also Him impressed into you, so that His life is imparted to you a little more. And you're renewed. And it produces a kind of rejoicing where you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And that joy is unspeakable and full of glory. Sometimes we, it's totally tangible where our, we are beside ourselves. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When you have that joy unspeakable, full of glory, that comes from an appreciation of Christ as your inheritance and enjoy Him, your soul is being saved, okay? What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And your, it's, it's also your conscience, your heart. Your spirit is the fellowship, the intuition, and the conscience. But the spirit meets the soul at your heart because the heart contains the mind, will, and emotions plus your conscience, which is the leading part of your spirit. And I don't have time to develop all that. But the heart is the bridge for all these different functions of your being. And the conscience is the pathway for the life that is in your spirit as a regenerated believer to become the life of your mind. Remember, the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. First, your spirit is life. If Christ dwells in you, though the spirit dead, his body is dead because of uh, sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness, right? But then your mind needs to become life. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Why? Because the spirit is life. What life is that? The glory of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. See, in uh, Romans 6, it says that even as God raised Christ from the glory of, by the glory of the Father, we should walk in newness of life. Newness of life is glory. It is Christ himself wrought into us. And he wants to be wrought into our mind. And then it says, and if the spirit who raised him, Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through 
his spirit that dwells in you. So this is a pathway of life from your spirit to your mind through a rejoicing appreciation, a joy unspeakable, full of glory of the inheritance, based on the inheritance, based on the acknowledgement of what you are as an heir of Christ and what he is to you as your inheritance, which is the gospel. Sorry. It's the, it's the riches of Christ as the gospel. Paul said he, he was sent to proclaim the rich, unsearchable riches of Christ as the gospel. All the riches of who he is and our appreciation of him brings us into the spirit and brings us into the mind of the spirit and saturates our mind and our conscience with life. That's why in Hebrews, when it talks about the perfecting of the conscience, it says that the way this happens is through a new and living hope, which is an anchor for the soul uh, that brings us into the presence within the veil. Our soul needs an anchor. Our mind, will, and emotions need to be dragged into the presence of God. And we have a high priest in the Holy of Holies that we are tethered to. Our spirit is regenerated and he lives there. And he's got an anchor for our soul to pull it in. It's called the new and living hope, which is the hope of glory. It's the realization of our inheritance. It's the appreciation of our inheritance that fills us with joy and satisfaction as we behold him. That is how he gathers us into himself and renews our mind and makes it life and peace. Man, allergies are something. It's terrible out here. Uh, so I hope this all makes sense. This is a lot, you know. It's a different concept of the spirit Christian life than those who think we're under the new covenant. And the reason I think we're under the, or the, the difference that is generated from new covenant thinking is law language, right? Oh, I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength because he wrote his law on my heart part. And you become a hypocrite because you're telling me that you're doing something you're not because you've got a concept tethered to the law and you don't know what the flesh is. You don't know what regeneration is. You don't know what God's salvation is, is in life. And this isn't just one group of people. This is 99% of Christians. Okay? This is what the enemy fights. Remember, if our gospel is hid, it's hid in those who are perishing whose minds are blinded by the God of this world so that they won't see the glorious shining, the gospel, the shining of the gospel. And you can back into 2 Corinthians and look those verses up. Their minds are veiled. When you look at everything through a law lens, you are veiled, according to 2 Corinthians 3, from seeing truths related to the glory. So it's pretty important that we get a clear concept, even though this teaching is really rare. And most people won't embrace it. Um, another consequence of believing we're in the new covenant is the legalism like I said, which leads to hypocrisy. If you think that he, you've got a new heart, you don't have a new heart. It's not take the stony heart out and put a new heart in. He did not give us a new heart. He regenerated our spirit. And now, by perfecting our conscience through the gospel and satisfying our mind with an appreciation of the riches of Christ as our inheritance, he brings our soul and our heart into life and Christ makes his home in our heart and that's what it says in uh, Ephesians, the prayer in Ephesians 3 he prays that God according to the riches of his glory would strengthen you into the inner man through his spirit so that you uh, so that Christ may make his home in your heart through faith how does Christ make his home in your heart through faith what is faith well faith comes by hearing the word and faith is just the eyes of my heart being opened to see the riches of the inheritance. And you know, you remember when uh, 
Abraham walked the good land. God said, you know, walk the length and breadth of it. Why? Explore your inheritance. Go see what I'm giving you. Well, listen to Ephesians 3, that God would strengthen you with might into your inner man. I think it's by the riches of his glory. That Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. What is that a reference to? That is faith. That's walking the breadth and the length of the good land. That is measuring your inheritance. Okay? And we do it together through the New Testament ministry. He says that you may, uh, you know, comprehend what is the breadth and length and uh, height and depth and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we can ask or think according to his power that works in us be glory in Christ Jesus in the church forever. If you listen to what I'm talking about and you, and you analyze those words it will produce a hallelujah in you. We're going to be filled unto the fullness of God. Now what he's talking about is the good land and the temple. In the Old Testament, the purpose was to bring the people into the good land, which was their inheritance, where they would build up the temple so that they could have God present. Okay. Well, when, the bio, when, the, when Paul talks about the fullness of Christ, which is the church, right? Ephesians 1 says that the church is his body, which is his fullness. The fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the church. And we are being filled unto the fullness of God. How? Well, he's strengthening us into his inner man. Into our inner man. According to the riches of his glory. With might. Into our inner man. And making Christ dwell. Or make his home. Abode. It's that word abide from John 14. Abode. In my father's house there's many abodes that Christ may make his home or abide in your heart through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be strong where did that strength come from the riches of his glory being strengthened into the spirit being wrought into us through our apprehension of Christ which is our faith and then with all the saints we may know be strong to know what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ which passes knowledge? That's our good land. And we have to be strong to take it. You can't take it weekly. You got to be strong in faith, giving glory to God, right? And then he says that you may be filled unto fullness of God. So you take the land and become the temple. You may be filled unto the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power which is resurrection which is Christ himself which is the glory strengthening us into the inner man according to his power that works in us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all ages where's the glory in the church what is the glory the riches of Christ which is our inheritance how do we apprehend it together through faith, through a New Testament ministry that attaches us and that reveals Christ as the inheritance and gives us a tour of what he is to us until our hearts are full of him and we even become his fullness. And so the New Testament ministry is the, is the means that God uses and it has to be in power. And uh, that's why he brings us through so many things. So that our faith would be in the power of God and not in our flesh. He consumes the outer man while renewing the inner man. Strengthening the inner man. Fortifying the inner man. And raising it up. And that's why I appreciate everything that's happened in the last five months. People have been saying, wow, the more this has been happening to you, the clearer your speaking has come, the more I'm getting set free. 
I know it's a New Testament ministry. God is vindicating his ministry. You know, the more, uh, the more we suffer together, the more utterance he gives us. So it's okay because the utterance and the distribution of the riches is our joy. That's our strength. It's worth it. Uh, now, again, this is not because we have a new heart in which the law is written. This is something so much higher and more profound. As members of the body of Christ, heirs of glory and co-heirs with Christ, sons of God, the fullness of Christ, the church, the mystery of Christ, the expression of God, the habitation of God, the fullness of God, in whom, in the church, be glory forever. That's where the glory resides. The riches, all the unsurgeable riches of Christ, his glory, everything that he is, our inheritance, becoming our food and drink. That is not just, oh, I'm writing my, giving you a new heart and I'm going to make you holy and cause you to walk in my ways. That's glorious too. The holiness of the children of Israel during the millennium will be beautiful. They will literally live out the Sermon on the Mount by God's power. Uh, they're, they'll, they're, they'll have holiness written on their foreheads, you know. But this is something different. This is the bride of Christ who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. His body. Something much higher and profound. Oh, so the New Covenant ideas bring us into a legal language that kind of filters through everything. For example, sorry, God, the spitting is terrible. It's just, um, I would do this video again because it's so gross, but you're just going to have to deal. Um, the Jewish wedding feast model that everybody loves is based on the assumption that we're under the new covenant and that the new covenant is a marriage covenant. Okay. But we are not in a marriage covenant with Christ. The pattern for marriage is not a covenant. God put Adam to sleep, took a rib out of his side, and produced Eve. He built it, Eve. The word is built. And she became his counterpart, and he said, You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is me. So it says, God created a man in his image, male and female. He created them. So it's him and them. It's cor corporate and singular. And that's what Christ is. It's Christ, the head, with his body that comes out of his side in his death and resurrection. Just as Adam was put to sleep and raised up as two, God was putting Christ to sleep in death and raised him up as two. Christ as the head with his church, the body, or bride, his counterpart. And he says, you're bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We're one person. And he nourishes and cherishes his church because we are his body. No man hates his own flesh, right? But nourishes and cherishes it. In the same way, Christ nourishes and cherishes us. How? By the washing of the water of the word. By supplying himself to us as food and drink. By renewing us. By washing us and transforming us. And causing us to behold him through the ministry of the New Testament. The ministry of the Spirit, which gives life. So that is not a covenant relationship. Again, a covenant is to establish part, uh, trust between two parties who both come from different situations or whatever and bring commitments and obligations to the table and say, I will do this if you will do that. So uh, this idea that the church is in a marriage covenant with Christ first of all, is legalistic because it's new covenant language. And that's another reason I don't believe John 14 is speaking of a marriage feast. That's where I said, like, if John 14 is speaking of the wedding and you look at the grounds for why they say that, well, they say it's because it, that Passover was a wedding covenant, a marriage covenant. No, for Israel, there's some kind of covenant, right? There's an agreement there, because they're not one. But the church comes out of his side. 
We're a mystery that was produced out of his resurrection. We didn't even exist before. When we are regenerated, our old man is dead. We are counted as naught, but we trade what we were for something so much higher as heirs of God and members of Christ, co-heirs with Christ, heirs of glory, brothers, co-kings, his body, his bride. It's worth it. But we're cut out of our, all of our past and our identity, which we just kind of is done. We just kind of is not. It doesn't matter compared to what's coming, you know, and what we have in Christ. So we are living a life of counting everything as dung that we may gain, know him for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and that we may gain him so that he can be wrought into us more and more and more. That's our joy. That's our satisfaction. That's our growth. That's our transformation. That's our renewal. And it is not by law keeping. It is by, and it is not a display of perfection. It's actually by being weak and brought into all kinds of various crazy things. Paul said he's made us a spectacle to the whole world. We're like a circus display. We are defeated. We are his captives in his victory chain train. When he talks about how he leads them in triumph, same stuff. Second Corinthians 3. He always leads us in his triumph and diffuses the knowledge of Christ in every place. The image is the triumphal procession. After a Roman army would take the captives, they'd come back into Rome with spoil. And at the end of the train, there were the captives in the ch in cages. And there was an incense bearer. And that incense, for those who were going to live, was a fragrance of life. But those who were going to be put to death was a fragrance of death. And he says, that's who we are. We are captives in Christ's victory parade. He went and spoiled the enemy and took us. And we're in, these, we're in his train. But everywhere we go, there's this incense, which is the knowledge of Christ in every place. And in those who are perishing, it's a fragrance of death unto death. And in those who are being saved, it's life unto life. That's a spectacle. That is not like what you'll see in Israel. In Israel, they'll be gloriously set up in a position of honor during their mortal life, during the millennium. But we don't have that. We have a treasure in an earthen vessel and God diffuses the fragrance of that treasure and gets it to come out of us and diffuses the knowledge of the glory of Christ for people by bringing us into weakness, humiliation, and even defeat. That's why the proper New Testament ministry will, will, will produce persecution and reproaches. The enemy will attack it, but God uses that to get the fragrance to come out. And what he shows is that he has spoiled the enemy and he's captured us. We were his enemies. We were on the wrong team before we got saved, you know. Then he saved us but his salvation of us was actually kind of a defeat. He defeats us. He defeats our strength. That's the true circumcision. He weakens our power. He shows us that our nothing good dwells in our flesh. He causes us through failure to learn the cross, to reckon ourselves as naught and agree with his judgment on the flesh so that we can be brought into life. So the spirituality of this New Testament inheritance is glorious inwardly, but that glory is hidden. What most people see when you're being when you're experiencing it the most is this weirdo in a cage being, you know, led around in a victory parade, and he looks defeated. You look at the language of Paul where he says, you know, we're cast down but not forsaken. We're crushed but not destroyed. We are, uh, we look like we're poor but we make many rich. We're accused on every side. We're, um, we look like we're being chastened but we're being vindicated. It's, an ox it's a paradox. The New Testament ministry is a paradox. And I'm not just speaking about myself. I'm saying if you partake of the word and you pursue godliness in this way, you will be persecuted like that. 
because that's the way. Uh, you know, Paul said in Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh. What is godliness? Christ manifested in me through this process of, on the one hand, I'm kind of suffering. It brings me into need. On the other hand, I'm looking away from my circumstances, which causes me, and looking at Christ by faith through the ministry of the word. And God is shining the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ in my heart, which is a kind of impress to press Christ into me, strengthen me into my inner man and cause Christ to dwell in my heart. It's not that he gives me a new heart. No, he puts Christ in my heart. He causes Christ to dwell in my heart through the renewing of the mind. Uh, while I'm going through that, I'm gaining Christ. That's godliness. That's the real godliness that has the power. What kind of power? The power for me to actually love Christ, respond to him, have my soul saved, be full of rejoicing and appreciation of him, which also quenches my thirst so that it's not really all that much temptation for me to fall back into sin. Sin doesn't reign out over me. I have, I have, I'm feasting. He's prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies, literally. And I'm feasting at that table. But th that is the godliness, okay? That's the real godliness, Christ manifested in the flesh. But Paul said, everyone who seeks to live godly will suffer persecution. Just by manifesting this savor of Christ, it's a savor of death unto death in those who are perishing. And I used that story that one time where I was at a Starbucks. All these people were talking about Buddha and Krishna and all that stuff. It was uncomfortable for me. Then comes in this little old homeless lady. And she says, Jesus is Lord. And I could feel her spirit. But the whole atmosphere of the place changed. And the fragrance, you could feel the tension in the air. And those that were perishing, it was death unto death. They hated it. Absolutely hated it. I remember when I was studying these truths, especially in John 14, and kind of getting into the this idea that God's writing Christ into me many years ago, before I really even understood how I was dead with Christ and I could rest. But I studied it for about a year, 2 Corinthians truth, and I kept having this feeling like, it was during lunch, I had this IT job, and I'd go study at lunch and during breaks, and it was like when I was reading the Word and studying, I felt like I was in a golden bubble, and God was writing on my heart with a diamond pen, and I was just in this shining glorious bubble I can't I mean it was like it was a mystical experience and I don't base anything on it but that's how profound this stuff was to me and it brought me into such peace and rest and such a fragrance of Christ I had some more peace during that time than I've ever had in my Christian life just like a constant feeling of the anointing and the presence of Christ and man the people at work hated me I didn't say anything I was this quiet guy that would just answer the phone and do my work I didn't even talk to anybody I was really shy but they would just make fun of me and persecute me and talk about me right there, you know. One time I looked at the guy next to me and he goes, I said, why do you make fun of me? I haven't ever said anything to you. He felt bad. He got really convicted. He said, I'm sorry, man. It's, I, I guess I just, you know, I guess I just, uh, it's because you're just always, you know. He didn't know what to say. What he was sensing was the purity in me. And his conscience was reacting. And he was fighting against it, you know. And that purity comes and goes. You can't, you gotta acknowledge that you are, have a treasure in an earthen vessel. Left to your own devices, you just go back to the flesh. But we have a high priest who is leading us in his victory. And he's always gonna make sure to bring us into whatever situations we need to be brought into to cause us to look away from our situation and look to him. Because eventually the situation becomes intolerable enough that Man, I need to look at Christ because everything out here sucks. And that's when he's working Christ into you and you gain him some more. And whatever you gain uh, will be manifested in glory as a shining. And that's why I said, you know, there's many people who can't do anything physically. But they're gaining Christ, gaining Christ, gaining Christ because of their limitation. And in glory, they're going to shine much brighter than the guy who was out doing ministry every day. So while they feel limited today, they'll be glorified then. The last will be a first, and the first will be last. You know? And it, it'll be fair. It'll be fine. We'll all be happy.
But this is exactly different, or 100% different, than the legalistic concept of God's writing his law in my heart, and I'm, I'm another party in the covenant, and I have obligations, and I need to keep my part and do my part, you know. There's so much bad stuff that comes out of that concept that we're under the new covenant that it's worth attacking pretty strong and getting solid about it. So again, if any of you want to transcribe these messages or get the transcripts and kind of clean them up a little bit, I can put a lot of scripture references in here and turn them into studies. Just email me if you're interested in doing that. All right, take it easy. I'm going to go blow my nose for about an hour. See ya.